topic is the reality and the rhetoric of unemployment. Who benefits and who loses? So what is really happening with unemployment in Australia today? And does government policy and does our public discussion on the issue deal with the problem adequately? Or indeed with any honesty or truthfulness? To give us some insights into this question, we are very privileged to have Professor John Buchanan, Dr. Sean Wilson, and Dr. Alan Morrison to speak with us tonight. Dr. Sean Wilson is a senior lecturer in the Department of Sociology at Macquarie University. His research lies at the intersection of political sociology, work and welfare, fiscal sociology, and political economy. He is on the editorial board for the Economics and Labor Relations Review. Last year, along with his colleague Alan Morris, who is also speaking tonight, Sean co-authored a paper called Struggling on the New Start Unemployment Benefit in Australia, the experience of a neoliberal form of employment assistance. Alan and I who wrote the paper on New Start, actually with our students at the University of New South Wales a few years ago, we will, in a sense, follow up on the other side of this story, not by looking so much at the labour market, but in, in, in how it's performing, but why it is that the unemployment benefit so so appalling in Australia and how it got into that situation and what some of the lived experiences of that uh, situation are. So I'm, I'm probably going to talk for about 10 minutes and Alan is going to follow with, uh, a, a, to give you a kind of taste of the experiences that people have in the inner city on, on Newstart. I really just want to make five points. <coughs> the first is that I think Australia is on the verge of experiencing somewhat like the United States of trying to run an advanced democratic capitalist economy really without a meaningful unemployment benefit. And that is that it is so low now, uh, it is at the very bottom of OECD unemployment benefits, especially for singles, uh, that it is projected to fall below 30% of average weekly earnings. Now in contrast to some of the Nordic social democracies and the continental welfare states, uh, uh, which have uh, um, much higher uh, unemployment be benefits when you measure it against average wages, we're not particularly surprised. But it's also mean <coughs> when you compare it against our, our Anglo-Saxon neighbours that have always thought of unemployment as something that was ultimately the, the fault of individuals, and that, that was never fully contested in our the, the English-speaking democracies and welfare states. How we got there is interesting, and, and we don't have time to explore that in detail tonight. But it's important to know that it's low, and it's, it's low for people here, but it's incredibly low when we look at international standards. I think Greece is now possibly lower, uh, and uh, oh it's, really, it's really dropped. But we're down there with something that people can't live on, and in Sydney, you know, they occasionally do uh, analyses of where you could afford to live on your own on, and rent a place in the Sydney metro area. I think it's out at Wyong, and it's only just, and it's you know, literally having baked beans and whatever every night to, to do it. So it's really no longer, in any sense, a serious unemployment benefit. It's particularly hard on singles uh, uh, for various reasons. Um, one of the reasons it's deteriorated is that pensions improved after the 1990s uh, because they were put on a, an indexation of, uh, to average weekly earnings when Newstart was deliberately le left to, to simmer along at, uh, at the inflation rate. Now, as we know, the where the average work is going will really tell us what where the cost of living is going for renting, for for eating out, for, for food, and so on. So anything that's indexed at a slower growing rate, at the bare minimum, starts to look like an absolute minimum, not a relative minimum. And that's exactly what's happened, and that will continue to to be a serious problem until average weekly earnings finally get back to the inflation rate CPI level, which is probably about now, but the damage has been done. So why is it the case that Australia, Australians, when you ask them about where welfare spending, and this is really an area of expertise for me, why is it the case that they're, they're pretty confident about spending on health, education, family payments, things for poor workers, extra support for poor, poor workers? But when you ask them about uh, support for the unemployed, whether we should be more generous or not, the answer for the last 20 years at least has been a flat no, actually longer than that. I think if you look closely at the data at the moment, things have improved very, very slightly. But most people think we spend too much on the unemployed. And 
it's a it's a kind of interesting puzzle to work out why it is that people have, from what I understand, fairly accurate perceptions of the unemployment benefit. It's a little bit they think it's a little bit more generous than it is, but it's not so far. But they still don't think we should spend too much more on it. Well, one of the things was to drill down into this data and have a look at how the most insecure workers in the economy, and this could be uh, lower end service workers and blue collar workers who tell survey uh, uh, questioners that they're relatively insecure compared to other groups and, and speculate why it is that they don't really have higher support for unemployment benefits than other workers. And it's a puzzle, isn't it, why insecure workers in the economy don't, in any of the modelling that I've done on this, show particularly high support for increasing unemployment benefits. And one of the things that sticks out very quickly is if you look at what drives hostility to unemployment benefits is uh, what, what are very clear perceptions that emerge from the data. That it's somehow linked to supporting the Aboriginal community and it's somehow linked to supporting migrants, particularly asylum seekers and, and recent migrants who don't work. And this is where, in a sense, the the, 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 the drivers of this negative public opinion come from come from what I think is a, a considerable racist element to that persists about who Australians, even insecure Australians in work, tend to think unemployed people are, and that has not been adequately challenged. Um, so those perceptions are, are particularly particularly severe. I think if you put it into the current particular in the current political um, world, I think we really see, a, uh, sorry, current political context, I think we really see a battle between two forms of insecurity. One is insecurity about our living standards, insecurity about jobs, and that's playing out in, in, in Australia today. The Abbott government's obviously affected that greatly. Uh, and the ob obvious other form of insecurity is about race, asylum seekers, national security, Islam, and so on. And the great success of the right, and I think it's happened in Britain, it's happened in Denmark last week, and it's happening here, is to take the first form of insecurity about jobs, living standards, uh, the, the place in the world for our children, etc., etc., and convert that insecurity, not for everybody, but for lots and lots of people, and far too many people, into insecurity about, uh, the, uh, about multiculturalism, about national security, about race and immigration. And that's, that is an essential conversion mechanism, mechanism that is driving current Australia and I think Western politics to, to a disturbing extent. Uh, and I think underlying it goes in, we, underlying this is an interesting phenomena about how we see migrants in the modern economy and why we're in a, in a kind of normative uh, trap, if you like, about this. So voters will, too many voters will, will tell pollsters that they, that they somehow think that migrants are more likely to be unemployed and taking up unemployment benefits. So the expectation, of course, you'd, you'd think is to go and get work. But as soon as, of course, migrants appear as successful migrants, new migrants, and they're in work, doing low-paid jobs, well then, of course, they're stealing jobs from everybody else. And so I think this normative track is the one we're bouncing between these two, these two particular poles and never escaping that. And it's become a very serious problem of how we deal with this, and one that's obviously paralysing contemporary social democracy to a great extent. Um, I think, drilling down further and thinking about this when I was coming here tonight, I think it also goes to what I speculate might be uh, a problem of how people see relative political efficacy of different issues. I think, and by that I mean how much they really believe they, that people think that governments can change unemployment today and how much they can change say, the, 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 the racial mix of the population or the migration levels and so on. My speculation is that people do not believe that governments can do anything about unemployment, that, that this is no longer something that governments have dealt themselves into doing something about. But for one reason or other, they see the more visible signs of a changing society and insecurity as, as governments being somehow, or political parties being more responsive to, to, to questions of uh, halting immigration, being tough on migrants, being tough on asylum seekers and so on. One of the biggest puzzles, and this brings me in a sense to my third point, is that when we looked, when you look closely at the support uh, for increasing unemployment benefits or 
reducing unemployment benefits, one of the really the biggest puzzles is that young people appear to be the harshest when we look at the age breakdown of uh, unemployment benefits. And I think Ross Gittins was speculating about this yesterday in his article about uh, the, the kind of invisibility of youth unemployment in Australia, which is obviously serious and it's creeping up and, and, and it's affecting parts of Australia that are largely forgotten by the, 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 the kind of the, 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 the big city big city driven politics. So it's very interesting to speculate and to think about why it is that young people have harsher views about unemployment benefits than older folk who are often you know seen as being you know uh, uninterested or un unempathetic about the, the plight of young people in unemployment. And I think this is the answer and I think uh, it goes uh, it, it can be explained alongside other research that's been done in the United Kingdom. I think this is the first generation that's grown up believing that unemployment is your fault. It's your fault. That you are responsible for your destiny in ways that older generations, whether left on the right, saw some role of government uh, in dealing with the problem of un unemployment. And it's interesting that the, the point in the data where people start to become quite significantly more hostile to increasing unemployment benefits is around the 34 year age mark. And I thought, how old are 34 year olds and now, okay, then how old would they have been, uh, say, uh, 16 years ago when they were 18 and their political socialisation was just beginning? And of course, you take 16 years off or 17 years off 2015 and you arrive at around, where we get, 1999, 1998, 1997. This is the era that work for the dollar was introduced <coughs> and that the rhetoric in Australia went from partially accepting responsibility for the unemployed right out to fully saying not only you're on your own uh, but it's entirely your fault if things go wrong. So it's not surprising that the cutoff in the data that reflects declining support for unemployment benefits is corresponding nicely or neatly, that's probably a better word, to the point at which the rhetoric in politics starts to move radically towards the, the, the individual solution and the, and the, the hard line work activation policies that began to emerge at the time. Now, some work done by my colleague Chris Deeming in uh, the United, United Kingdom, which was reported in The Independent last year, in a sense corroborates a lot of this story. Uh, so he, he showed uh, that in the late 1990s when uh, Prime Minister Blair had taken office, uh, that the, the tough line that Labor started to take towards unemployment benefits uh, had in fact uh, not change the views of conservative voters who were already hostile to them, but change the views of Labor voters. So we all sit around in groups thinking about and talking about politics um, like, you know, like monkeys. You know, we're always kind of, you know, grooming each other about our politics and trying to work out what each of us think. And one of the things that we all do as political communities is look to leaders on the left or right for our political ideas. When the left moved to the right on this issue, Labor voters followed. And we had a generation of people who are on the left on all kinds of other things, other things that the data strongly supports suddenly become harsher to people who are unemployed. And that, I speculate, was most convincingly uh, the case for younger left of centre voters who, who have, have, have slipped away from supporting <coughs> generosity to the unemployed, but moreover seeing government as playing a role in, in resolving these problems. So I think that goes to some of the way to explaining, at least from the point of public opinion, why it is that we're, we're that, that, that we're not that governments aren't responding to this crisis either in the way that obviously John's talked about within the labour market proper, but also in the hugely insecurity generating and reinforcing problem that New Start represents for all people who are in insecure work or who are unemployed. And I think that if we were to talk. I was to editorialise about, and this again in the spirit of John's uh, comment about friendly criticism to the Labor Party, I think the, the, the importance now to talk about job security uh, and decent transitions for people into work and within work is a critical, <coughs> critical part of what's missing in Labor's agenda at the moment. And uh, my expectation is that once Labor Party starts to listen to that, that they will make some headway against the other form of insecurity which is really dominating now, which of course is national security. And I think it's the job 
of everybody on the left and certainly here is to see these two worlds of insecurity as a, a as balancing each other and, and and to see economic insecurity but particularly job insecurity as the defining issue on the left for Labour parties and other parties in the social coalition that want a progressive future to identify and to develop policies and and coherent responses to that talk to ordinary people about these things. And the big hurdle, of course, is not just developing those policies, but it's, it's dealing with and repairing the damage in trust and expectations that governments can do anything about this problem.